Afghanistan. Good evening. I'm Tony Jones. Welcome to this Melbourne Writers' Festival Q&A, live from the ABC in Southbank, and here to answer your questions tonight. Historian and author Rutger Bregman, who argues for a realistic utopia. Amani al Katabi, the founder and editor of Muslim Girl, the most popular platform for Muslim women's voices in the United States. Indian politician and author Shashi Tharoor, who believes Britain's occupation of India exploited and impoverished his country. English feminist firebrand Laurie Penny and the director of the Lowy Centre for International Relations, author and essayist Michael Fullylove. Please welcome our panel. <laughs> Thank you. Now, Q&A is live across Australia on ABC TV, iView and News Radio at 9.35 Eastern Standard Time. And you can stream us around the world on YouTube, Facebook and Periscope. Well, our first question comes from Katie MacDonald. Laurie Penny. In the wake of Brexit and the Trump presidency, many have blamed radical progressive liberalism and the rise of political correctness. It is argued that movements such as feminism and equal rights for minorities have alienated and agitated a silent majority that are now revolting against the liberal agenda. With this in mind, how do we continue to fight for equality and equity for all without aggravating or disenfranchising the other side? Well, Laurie, welcome back. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. It's, it's great to be back. Thank you for your question. Uh, before I answer, I'd like to start by... Uh, acknowledging the traditional owners of the land we're meeting on, uh, the Wur I'm really hoping I'm going to say this right, uh, the Wurundjeri people of the Kula Nation, uh, and pay my respect to their elders, past, present, and future. Um, oh, thanks. Uh, uh, so um, we've been hearing this a lot since Brexit, since the election of Donald Trump, that really it's the left's fault and it's women's fault and it's Muslim people's fault and the fault of people of colour for just asking for too much equality and too much change. And really, you know, it's look what you made us do, is what I hear. And that's, it is the language of, of, of an abuser and it is the language of children. The idea that you are so aggravated by any threat to your sense of superiority, so agitated by any threat to your own privilege that a, a sudden lack of privilege feels like prejudice. Well, it's not prejudice. It is, um, I don't think as political people, as activists and as people who care about you know, a livable future for the human race, we should be moderating our language at this point the opposite. I think this is when we go harder because ultimately you, you can't do feminism, you can't do anti-racism, you can't do any kind of political politics, any kind of progressive politics, sorry, if your first objective is to make the other side feel comfortable, that's a real, that's a, a way to just scupper yourself before you're out of the gate. But Laurie, not, when yeah. you're talking about it in terms of sides, is that part of the problem that's been identified by the question? Are progressive movements moving too fast for a section of the population in the United States, in Britain and in parts of Australia? Well, I'm sure some people do feel uncomfortable with the pace of social change, but I would suggest they get used to it. Really, I don't think it's my job to make people who are sexist feel more comfortable. I'm not a politician, I'm a writer, and my job is to push the discussion forward. And if I'm saying... So there is a difference. If, if I'm saying, oh, um, I think that... I should have more rights to bodily autonomy. And you say, I don't know what you actually think about this, but may, let's say you say, well, that makes me feel a bit uncomfortable. Mm. My job then is not to say, oh, well, I'm sorry you feel uncomfortable. Your feelings are obviously more important than my right to bodily autonomy. Those things aren't equal. You know, it's, it's not... We, we seem to think that the feelings of people in positions of power are of equal importance and equal moral value to the basic right to life and autonomy of people who don't have that privilege. I think let's that's quickly, wrong. Let's quickly go back to uh, Katie, our question. Um, what do you think? I mean, you raise this issue. I mean, do you think there's a genuine disaffection out there in parts of the community? The progressive movements are going too fast for them? I have always believed pretty much what, um, what Laurie has been saying up until Trump was voted in. And I, then I began, began to question um, my hardline progressive uh, view. I still, I still am progressive and I, I still would say I'm a feminist, but 
I also, I, I also am concerned about um, ignoring or alienating another group and ending it's up... It's not your fault. Yeah. It's not, this is, Trump, Donald Trump is not your fault. It's oh. like, <laughs> it's, no, really, like, we really should, like, I really get, in some ways, I, there is this paradoxical way where when we hear, oh, you know, it's kind of our fault, we went too far, um, there is something almost a little bit empowering about that in a, in a toxic way, thinking, oh, well, maybe if we'd made a different choice, then it could have been different. Actually, no, Donald Trump is the fault of racists and sexists. Mm. Let's, and let's, uh, let, uh, Laura, I'm well, going to just well, interrupt you there, only because we've got an American on the panel, and uh, I'd like to uh, uh, hear from Imani. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, uh, as a woman of colour, I don't think that the change is happening fast enough. You know, of course, mm. when we leave it to society to dictate how we progress forward, it's going to take a lot longer, and we're talking about people's livelihoods here. Um, if anything, like, I would argue that there are some people that deserve to be disenfranchised. They deserve to get left behind. Like, what, what are we pausing ourselves for it's, it's so that we can really cater to people that are mad that, you know, they, they don't get to enjoy the privileges that they've had historically for so long that come at our expense, at the expense of other people's livelihoods? Um, if, if anything, I think that this really is the death rattle of racism, right? It's grasping at straws because we are in a changed world. Things are progressing and moving very quickly, and they need to continue progressing that way. But, Amani, can I, can I sure. put this to you? I mean, when, when uh, Hillary Clinton came out and referred to Trump supporters as a basket of deplorables, there was a huge backlash, and probably more people jumped into the basket than ever before. Um, is that part of the problem, that this kind of idea that the progressive left has it... Has, understands everything I mean, and I think, you understand nothing. I, I think the problem is that people are voting for Trump in the first place. You know, I think that's the problem that we have to address here, not the way that we choose to respond to that. Um, if anything, we should make it so that there's zero tolerance for that, those kind of attitudes to exist within our society. There's no room for that type of intolerance. I mean, look at what happened, right? We started giving Trump airtime in the media mm -hmm. and giving him an opportunity to present his racist ideologies as a, a position on a policy platform. It resulted in him actually getting elected. And now it resulted in white supremacist rallies in the streets neo-Nazis going like this again. You know, we really just regressed several generations backward. All this hard work for us to get to this point to make it unacceptable to be racist, now it's out in the open again. Yeah, Shashi, you're a politician. What do you think? I mean, obviously, you've spent a lot of time looking at this and thinking about it. Well, I think part of the problem, really, is that every movement creates or provokes a reaction, and there's going to be reactions, whether it's the right that's making advances or the left. There's no question that the world has moved on. I don't think this show, when it first began, would necessarily have had the first guest acknowledging the owners of the land and paying tribute to their elders. That's already a sign of respect for a sensitivity that was ignored in the past in Australia. I think you'll certainly find that uh, the way in which the discourse has moved around the world on things like homosexual rights, on things like um, other privileges for same-sex couples, transgenders, all of this... Not moving very bit... fast in India, your own country, I should say. Well, transgenders, curiously, is moving faster than same-sex relationships mm. uh, in terms of political acceptability, mm. simply because culturally we've simply been used to them being around all this time. Uh, homosexuality, frankly, was completely acceptable in Indian culture for, for 2,000 years till the Brits came along and, uh, yeah. and outlawed it. Yeah. And then we have you this... You know, we are going to come... We're, we're going to come to your notions of the Brits. We, 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 but let's we just, stuck with it, yeah. I'm sorry to interrupt you. That's all right. We're, we're gonna, I'm just going to go to our next question because it's on the same subject or a similar subject and uh, we'll bring in the other panellists on that one. It's from Giorgio Kiriakou. Yeah, so re recently, Triple J presenter Tom Tilly was attacked for interviewing a white nationalist after the events in Charlottesville. How do the hate and death threats sent by the good-willed uh, left towards an impartial interviewer differ from the evil that is associated with attacks by white nationalists? And how come we can't ask why an individual supports a movement without being labelled a supporter ourselves? Let's hear from our other panellists first. Michael Fullylove. You'd be familiar. Maybe you should explain for our international guests what Triple J is to start with. <laughs> Tri Triple J is a great, a great radio station that I'm just still allowed to listen to. Um, <laughs> look, I think that that particular case was outrageous. Um, and it's also stupid and self-defeating. Um, and if our goal here is to persuade people that... Um, uh, to, to, to progress, then, then we don't want to alienate them in that way. So I think, I think it, it can be Lord of the Flies online and it's very unpleasant and, and I prefer to 
always think, what would Barack do in these circumstances? And it's not alienate people and threaten them, it's trying to persuade them. But if I can just come back to Katie's question also, Tony, for a second, I don't think political correctness elected Donald Trump. I think there were real issues about income stagnation for mm. ordinary people, about disillusionment with elites, not political correctness so much, but governments that don't seem to be able to manage the economy and win wars in the way, for example, in the way that they have in the past. But as an historian, I'd say that in addition to these vast impersonal forces and these in populism and so on, individual political um, decisions that leaders make also matter. I think if Hillary Clinton had run a better campaign or if someone else had run against Donald Trump, then Donald Trump wouldn't have won and we'd be sitting here saying, you see, outsiders don't matter, insiders have won. In, Bre in, in the Brexit case, for example, I think if David Cameron hadn't made the very foolish and feckless decision to put European unity and British unity to a referendum, if Boris hadn't supported it, then Britain wouldn't be Brexiting. So these big social movements matter, but within the context of those movements, individual decisions that leaders matter make also matter, and that should give us hope, because if we've made... If they've made some bad decisions, then they can also make good decisions. OK, I just want to hear from Rutger, and I'll go back to you, Laurie. I know you want to jump in. Um, now, I mean, you're a journalist as well as uh, an academic, so what do you think about the idea of interviewing someone uh, from the right, from basically from the white supremacist movement involved mm -hmm. in those um, events in Charlottesville? Well, you know, what I worry about a little bit is that we're having all these debates about statues, about symbols, national symbols. It's, it's the same in my country, Holland. Mm -hmm. And, and all, the, all this time we're not talking about, you know, structural real issues out there. Poverty, unemployment, a third of the workforce stuck in jobs that are completely meaningless, a financial sector that is basically about extracting wealth from the rest of the population. So, yeah, sometimes I worry that we spend a little bit too much time on these issues. You know, I've got my timeline on Twitter and everything is about Charlottesville and, and faces, etc. But let's remember that this is like a very tiny part of humanity, you know, and they want our attention. They want us to be talking like, like it's, it's a now about the, the subjects. But it's a tiny part of humanity for you. Mm -hmm. but it's the entire livelihoods of the people that they are discussing mm -hmm. whose lives are actually on the, on the line as a result of that. Right? Yeah, so I don't think we can mm -hmm. minimalise white supremacy in that. I think that's very dangerous. Mm -hmm. And with, with the greatest respect, I think, you know, we, we can and should talk about income inequality, but not instead of talking about racism and I'm white supremacy. That. No, I know that's not what you're saying. Mm -hmm. I think, Laurie, there's actually two kinds of backlash going on in the world right now. There is a backlash against globalisation, which has created winners and losers, and these people see themselves as losers. Mm -hmm. And they ask why they should vote for politicians or sending their jobs off to Shanghai. But there's also a cultural backlash going on. I think Michael talked about the yeah. globalised elites, right? Hillary and Goldman Sachs, all of this stuff. It was a revolt against uh, Davos man on the economic front, but it was also a revolt for greater cultural authenticity, uh, religious identity, nationalism. All of these things, I think, lay behind Trump, lay behind Brexit, lie behind Gert Wilders in the Netherlands mm -hmm. or Marine Le Pen in France. This is a phenomenon that's worldwide. I mean, the details, the manifestation may vary from place to place. Yeah, no. But these two backlashes are taking place. Sometimes they're both together. Sometimes they're separate. For in India, we have a cultural uh, backlash mm -hmm. with a party that's very much, you know, for a religious identity, just like Turkey. Mm -hmm. But uh, we don't have a backlash against globalisation. They want to be Davos men. They don't want to reject mm -hmm. Davos men. Well, uh, I'm going to go back to, um, to Laurie because uh, you haven't had a chance to address the question uh, yeah. that was asked there. And I know you want to. Uh, but he's essentially asking, why would the left attack so stringently and so horribly someone who's simply doing an interview? Well, um, speaking of somebody who is both on the left and has interviewed members of the far right myself... Um, this is something I've encountered. I encountered a fierce backlash when I chose to do that. And I think it is, it is an active, critical discussion right now. I don't think it's something you can necessarily sum up in 140 characters. And a lot of people said to me, no, you couldn't have gone into that space and done those interviews had you been a woman of colour. And I take that point. And I am going to change the way I conduct that work in the future. Not necessarily going to stop doing it, but I, I, I think and I take critique. Um, but one thing I would say 
is that we have to think about content here as well as form. Yes, the left can be nasty. I have met, have you met the left? I have met the left. I've spent quite a long time on the left. I actually hang out with people who are apolitical sometimes because like, it gets a bit much, but I still believe in what they're doing. And, you know, just because- Can I just, just interrupt you there just for a second? May I make one point? Oh yeah, sure, go ahead. Look, so if somebody is shouting at you, and somebody is shouting that you should, that somebody like you should die, and then another person is shouting that somebody like you should be protected. The thing that matters is not that those people are shouting. The thing that matters is what they're saying. And speaking personally, being critiqued strongly for the way I chose to do my journalism and being called or accused of racism is not as bad as experiencing racism on a day-to-day -day basis. Being called, make falsely, a white supremacist, which I'm not, is still not as bad as white supremacy. So I'm sucking it up and I suggest that the rest of people, do, uh, other people do too. So just briefly, I just wanted to ask you about um, the alt-left. Uh, it's a, not a, a thing. A notion it coin. It's not a thing. <laughs> a notion coin. Well, there is such a thing no, as, there, there is isn't. such a thing as Antifa. That's what Antifa. Trump was talking Anti about. Antifascist. Antifascist, yes, that's right. Who went, um, as the right did, armed into Charlottesville. They didn't, ha they didn't go with guns. Mm -hmm. They went with clubs and they were photographed with guns. So I'm just saying that Trump had a kind of little inkling of a point no, here he that he could turn around and say well his argument was there was vi this is the, this is this is what happened in america you see he said there was violence on both sides then there was a poll that said 67 percent of republicans agreed with him so you see the divide what, emerging over these arguments if donald trump says that the sky was green 67 percent of republicans would agree would agree that's not a fact that isn't that's is a canvas of opinions of people who are already being misled look i am an anti-fascist I have a great many friends and comrades who are members of anti-fascist groups or Antifa. I think that I personally believe that if fascists want to come and march down your street mm -hmm. and racists want to come and down and march mm -hmm. down your street, you stop them and you yep. stop them by whatever means necessary short of physical violence. I don't think there is a the moral equivalence is, The problem here. is Antifa don't stop short of physical violence. They yes, include they do. physical violence. But, there is, a diff there is a difference between property destruction and running over people. You know, oh, no, white nationalists, white nationalists, white nationalists in the United States have killed four people this year that we know about. Antifa, the anti-fascists, have smashed some windows and torn down a statue. Those are not living people. There is a moral difference here, and I think we really should stick to that moral difference. Okay, and I want to bring Imani on. Yeah, I mean, those, those people that were marching down the streets with weapons, uh, the neo-Nazis, are the same individuals that multiple times earlier this year showed up to mosques with mm -hmm. guns. They showed up to places of worship to intimidate and to impose violence. So now, because people are reacting to it, right, that's not the source of the problem, and to talk about it as if it is, is creating a false equivalency. And that's a huge disservice yeah. to the issues at hand right now. You know, neo-Nazism is not the opposite of leftism, right? Yeah. Like, it's not even on the spectrum. Neo-Nazism equals hate. And that's the way people are treating it. When they are, when there's a backlash because a neo-Nazi is on television and they're sharing their opinions, it's because of the fact that they are getting that airtime and that we're actually affirming, we're legitimizing those opinions and, and that racist ideology as if it has any space in the conversation at all. And it does not, right? And thank you. That's, that's where it comes from. That's what it's good at. OK, I'll bring Rutger in here because you're from Europe and... Um, mm -hmm. You'd be very familiar with the Weimar Republic, and uh, the American right is now talking about the possibility of Weimar-like activities on the streets of the United States, where mm -hmm. anti-fascists and fascists clashed, destabilizing the Weimar Republic. You know, what I worry about a little bit is that, you know, when you think about someone like Donald Trump, he is one of the great utopian thinkers of our time. He's, like, really changing the course of world history, you know? It would have seemed completely unimaginable just three or four years ago, and now we're here. But that should be the task of progressives, you know, to make the unrealistic realistic, to make the impossible inevitable. So the problem, I believe, with the modern left is, is even though I agree with everything that's been said so far, the problem is that we often only know what we're against, right? We're against austerity, against the establishment, against homophobia, against racism, against everything, right? But you also need to be for something. We need to talk much more about, 
you know, are the positive visions that, that can actually give people hope and that we can build a movement around. And, and that's not, not really happening when we're only tweeting about Char Charlottesville. Okay, can I, can we, just, we don't, yes, you just can, Michael. Just, just one point. Uh, it's a real tragic irony that Charlottesville has come to be known as a code for moral blindness because for so long Char Charlottesville was a code word for moral clarity. FDR in nine, speech. In 1940, mm -hmm. FDR gave a great speech at Charlottesville where he, he called out the fascists, the Nazis who were invading Western Europe, and he, he introduced a policy of rearmament and of aid to the opponents of force. And it, it is a real um, tragedy for an America file like me that we now have a president of the United States who is doggedly neutral as between Nazis and people who oppose Nazis. Mm -hmm. There's one thing we need the president of the United States to be against, and that's Nazis. Yeah, it, you'd, you'd think it would be hard, wouldn't you? Okay. Is it hard to be against Nazis? I don't know. Somebody asks you, are you against Nazis? And you have to think about it for a while. <laughs> I'm, yeah, I mean, when that's your voter base. Yes. <laughs> it's also, I, I guess, just to, to clarify on one point, I don't think it's possible to be, to take a neutral position between Nazis and anti-fascists. I think in that context, a neutral position is support for fascism. Mm -hmm. You know, there is no middle of the road here. Mm. I think Michael might have been making that point. Yes, uh, exactly. Next question is from Karima Farouk. Far from online happy snaps, we nowadays lob molotail cocktails on the internet to get a reaction. And online trolls direct personal insults and slurs to those whose voices and opinions they disagree with. The US president communicates essential messages with a few lines on Twitter. Pauline Hanson saunters into federal parliament in a burqa in a move more suited to a performance artist than a politician. And yes, it has affected public opinion. Do you think we'll ever return to a time of discourse and an attempt at consensus? Just like slow food, do you think we need to try slow politics? Or has the instant nature of our world changed the way we digest things forever? Shashi, let's <laughs> give us a slow answer. <laughs> <laughs> Well, some politics, politicians are performance artists, I'm afraid, so yeah. it may well be that what she's saying is... And I, I was an early adopter on Twitter, and there was a time when you could actually have real conversations with real people on social media. Now, certainly in the Indian context, it's all taken over by organised armies of politically-minded tweeters. It's taken over by, as you said, the trolls who are out there to spew venom and hatred that in real life they really couldn't. I mean, I've... I've once or twice actually met some of these people, and they're absolute lambs in person. But there's something about the <laughs> anonymity of the Internet that emboldens them to spew the most vituperative, vile stuff at people, and, and it doesn't cost them anything, sadly, literally or otherwise, and they get away with it. Um, how can we slow this down? I mean, you can't put the genie back in the bottle. Social media is here to stay. Um, perhaps if, 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 if it weren't so useful... Uh, to politicians, for example, more of us would walk away from it, but we can't afford to because whatever percentage of, of that hate out there, uh, uh, however high it may be, there's still some real people reading what you have to say. Some of the things you're saying is, I mean, making the news or helping influence the national agenda, so you keep plugging away. I, I don't have a better answer to you right now. Right now, for example, the number of uh, people on, on Facebook in India has crossed 200 million. I mean, you just can't ignore them. Mm. I'm going to uh, go to Laurie. Now, I know that you've, and you all claimed it pretty much earlier, these are times to be more radical, mm -hmm. but you've also talked about radical kindness and radical softness. Is there an element in that question that, that resonates with those ideas? Well, sometimes the internet makes it difficult, and particularly Twitter makes it difficult to, to have a nuanced discussion, and it makes it hard to have shades of grey, and I know I was just before saying there are some issues you shouldn't have shades of grey on, but it, it, it's difficult to have an extended conversation, and it's difficult in particular for people to grow and change online, and I, and I really try not to sound like a hippie here, not that I have anything against hippies, and my best friends are hippies, <laughs> but, um, 
like there has to be a possibility, particularly in fast moving political times, for people to change their opinions and to become better. Otherwise, if people continue to be punished and raked over the coals for stuff they did years, even decades ago, now that we've had the internet for so long as a part of our daily lives, then there'll be less incentive for people to actually try and make that change. Um, because it's, you know, a lot of people are learning new things really fast. And I don't know. I, I tend to be a bit kumbaya about this, I've mm -hmm. been told. I tend, I tend to be a bit over for what's, forgiving what's online. What's radical kindness? What does that mean? Well, honestly, in times like these, just a little measure of forgiveness can be radical in itself. And I'm really doing a terrible job of not sounding like a hippie. I'm really, really sorry. What's wrong with but, that? Oh, mm -hmm. you're nice. <laughs> <laughs> There's radical kindness right there. There we yeah. go. <laughs> there we go. But there let is. me bring in Michael. I mean, the, part of that question was about the president tweeting, which mm. is the most astonishing um, development, I think, mm. that um, we see <clears throat> policy uh, changing almost by the hour from the White House, uh, from the Oval Office, or mm. from his bed, mm. if he actually mm. goes to bed. Mm. <laughs> it's a terrible image. Well,. <laughs> Look, I think, I think to, to come to the question, I think I mean, one way of doing slow politics is to require politicians to do more writing, given this is, this is the Writers' Festival Q&A. I mean, I find that when you write, you improve your thinking because... Exactly. And, and I'm not talking about 140 characters. If you write something, <laughs> even as short as an op-ed, you have to logically structure your argument. You have to think how would somebody counter those arguments. And so I wish that more politicians would write because I think um, you, you would get less of the, the, the sort of the cheap stunts that we saw from Senator Hanson. Mm -hmm. I don't want to sound again like, like an Obama fanboy, but one thing that, that struck... It's, it's hard not to be an Obama fanboy <laughs> in the era of Donald Trump, I might say, but, <laughs> but one thing that, that was very notable about Obama was that when he um, confronted a very difficult issue he would sit down and he would write a long speech and he got criticism for, for, for too much speechifying and not enough acting. But I admired the fact that he would embrace the complexity of issues and he would, th he would express himself in, in an argument. And you remember during the 2008 campaign when he was being criticised on race, he gave that beautiful speech in Philadelphia. Uh, when he was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize, perhaps a little, a little early, um, he really made an important and interesting argument about the use of force. So, so I would like to see more politicians writing, not just on Twitter, but actually sitting down and trying to make an argument. Yeah. Amani, <laughs> well, there you go. Amani, what do you think? I mean, you operate in the online world. Yeah, I mean, I think you, you put it perfectly that you can't put the genie back in the bottle. Uh, in this day and age, you know, just like how social media and the internet gives a platform to marginalized voices to have a fighting chance to be heard, it also offers the same exact platform for all of the hate and the misinformation to get out there. And there have been countless op-eds and studies about how fake news really contributed to the rise of Trump. Uh, and, and I think that that really just affirms everyone's individual responsibility when it comes to the media that we choose to consume. But the question that seemed to be suggesting we maybe have an opportunity here to step out of this fast-moving social media uh, run agenda and slow things down, uh, as Michael was suggesting, by writing, for heaven's sake. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm sorry to say, but I think things are just going to continue to speed up. Mm. And, and as that happens, as we continue to move forward with the technology that's available to us, with how quickly we're, we're able to communicate these messages, we need to really be conscious of what we are consuming and the sources of those things. You exactly. know, when, when we're addressing issues that are, 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 are uh, really pertinent to specific communities, for example, specific types of people, then why not turn to media sources that are coming from those people to hear from them from themselves? You know, they can speak on their own behalf. Nobody needs to speak for them. That's, that's literally the philosophy, beh philosophy behind MuslimGirl.com, and social media is the only reason why I'm able to sit on a panel like this today. And as a politician who writes, let me say that a lot more people read the 140-character tweets than read the books. <laughs> so, uh, exactly. I'm well, glad we have uh, quite a few people reading your books. Oh, uh, not as many as read my tweets, but... Um, <laughs> Rutger. Well, I think it's really important, you know, in, in cases like this, to remember that 
something like the news is really about exceptions all the time. You know, it's about things that go wrong, about corruption, about crises, about terrorism, etc. So if you watch a lot of the news, as much of it, most of us do, we only hear about these exceptions. And at the end of the day, we know exactly how the world is not working. So we have a completely misguided view of, you know, this, the history of, of human nature, etc., etc. So what I always recommend to people is to throw your television out the window. <laughs> now, <laughs> that might be you went, you might 30 minutes from now, you can <laughs> do it. <laughs> Just, but, just, just take a good but, and read more you books. Yeah. Um, okay. Now remember, uh, we're going to move on to uh, some current crises. Remember, you can join the discussion on Twitter, on Q and A Extra, on Facebook Live, and ABC News Radio straight after this program. Our next question comes from Cassie Snikas. With Donald Trump saying he'll respond to the delicate situation of North Korea's nuclear war cry threats with aggressive claims of fire and fury. Isn't the Australia-US alliance placing Australia in a dangerous position? Michael. Well, thank you, Cassie. Uh, I would agree that Donald Trump's um, policy... There's been as much confusion, if you like, about Donald Trump's policies on North Korea as there was about the location of the USS Carl Vinson a couple of months ago, the, the warship that he said was steaming to the Korean <laughs> Peninsula and it turns out to be somewhere else. He's, he's been incoherent. On the one hand, he, he calls for fire and fury. On the other hand, he says that um, he's willing to meet Kim Jong-un and make a deal. But, but let's not forget who is driving this crisis, because we've, we've criticised Mr Trump a lot tonight. But who's driving this is Kim Jong-un, a young man in a very big hurry, who is absolutely ruthless, who is prepared to use um, a weapon of mass destruction at a major commercial airport in order to e assassinate his brother, um, who is willing to provoke not only the United States to defy UN Security Council resolutions, but even to provoke his ally, China. So I think it's important to focus on, on, on where the threat here is coming from. It's coming from North Korea. Now, do I have an enormous amount of faith in Mr Trump to, um, to apply the right balance of carrots and sticks? I, I don't. But I, I think to immediately pivot and start to, um, uh, you know, criticise Trump or the alliance as opposed to the person who's actually Sure, but bringing... that, that is a question about whether the person who you regard as behaving dangerously um, could cause, cause Australia through the alliance to get involved in a conflict. So I guess that's the heart of that question. Well, I think that Australia has interests in North Korea. I mean, the idea that... In, in the Korean Peninsula, the idea that it's nothing to do with us, I don't agree with that. I mean, uh, North Korea has threatened Australia. It increasingly has the capability to lob missiles as far as the Australian continent. We are a US ally, but we also have an interest in a peaceful, stable and secure North Korea. So I don't think we should, by any means, automatically enter some sort of conflict with, the, with uh, North Korea. I think we should not be an automatic ally of the United States, but do we have equities and interests in a peaceful, stable North Korea? Is it in our interest that together the United States and China can somehow find the leverage to, to uh, force or to push Kim Jong-un to, in, to, to, to come up with some sort of freeze of his programs? Absolutely, we have an interest in that. Shashi, former diplomat, what do you think? Well, I think we've got to think for a minute that maybe the actors on this are not as irrational as they seem to all of us. And Kim Jong-un probably is looking, for example, at Saddam Hussein's experience. He's saying this guy boasted about weapons of mass destruction and he got overth overthrown by the Americans for his pains. Let me show them I have weapons of mass destruction and they won't dare to overthrow me. So it's a way of buying himself, in a sense, perpetuity, uh, regime insurance, if you like, or insurance against regime change. In some ways, therefore, what he's doing with all of this is saying, don't try and overthrow me because the price you'll have to pay is far too high to pay. He's saying, Seoul is easy for me to take out. Guam is easy for me to nuke. Japan is within the range of my missiles. That's why he just fired one above it. Hmm. San Francisco isn't too far away either, folks. So do you want to play that kind of hard wall with me 
or will you let me, will you leave me alone to be myself? Is that the sort of hard ball that India plays with Pakistan? Oh, I wish. No. no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> because, I mean, both, no, because... both North Korea, India and Pakistan, well, the three of them, have all broken international laws in order no, to build a nuclear exactly. arsenal. No, not exactly. It's a little more complicated than that. India not has... that much more complicated. Well, it is. India, India rightly, I think, consider the non-proliferation non -proliferation treaty to be an abomination. It's the last existence of apartheid in international law, mm. where a bunch of countries says that we are entitled to have something that the rest of you are not. Mm. I mean, that's racism, plain and simple, but and it will not be that's, acceptable. that's the argument of North Korea. Exactly. So what I'm trying to say mm. is maybe we'll have to live with a nuclear North mm. Korea. As Tom Lehrer said in the famous lyric, the Lord's our shepherd says the psalm, but just in case, we better have a bomb. That's exactly what, <laughs> that's exactly what uh, Kim Jong-un is thinking. I don't admire the man. He's everything that Michael says he is. He's a nasty character. He's a Stalinist dictator. Mm. He's putting his people in great misery and poverty. But at the same time, he, if you think of him as a rational actor, what he's doing is a fairly rational calculation. And it, mm. I think it should give pause to anybody who might be contemplating any military adventure against North Korea. The price would be far too high to pay. Um, does anyone think China should do more? Um, Michael, you first. China should absolutely do more. I mean, China has more leverage in this case than... They than... supply food and fuel. That's right. right. They have more leverage, but they also have different interests from the United States and different interests from the rest of us. And Well, I in think... other words, they're quite happy to see North Korea sort of running around threatening the United States. They're not threatening China. And while the United States is being destabilised in this region, that's to China's advantage, isn't it? There's some advantage to them from that. I think... Uh, I mean, they're an ally of North Korea... Um, they like a buffer state between um, their territory and, and South Korea. But I think the, the benefit, the cost-benefit ratio may be changing a little bit because Kim Jong-un is being so provocative and so forward-leaning here that this is making life very complicated for the Chinese. They don't want a nuclear test on their border a month before they have the 19th Party Congress. And this is where I'd put one caveat. I agree with almost everything Shashi said, but I'd, I'd place one caveat, and that is, I think for a long time we have assumed that the North Korean uh, quest for a bomb is all defensive. It's all about regime continuity. But when you look at the series of provocations that Kim Jong-un has engaged in, the fact that he has... Um, launched more missile tests this year than his father did in his old time in office. I think we're dealing with a more um, ambitious figure. I don't think he just wants to, to ensure regime continuity. I think he wants to be a major player in Northeast Asia. I think he has ambitions for how North Korea plays in the region. So I think all of us are changing our analysis somewhat, I think, about, about this regime. All right, we've got plenty of questions to get through. We're going to move on. The next one's from uh, Lakshmi Ayer. Thank you, Tony, and welcome to our international panel to this cold city of ours today. Australia has been debating same-sex marriage for years now, and if the High Court approves it, we will have a voluntary, non-binding postal survey on this very issue. Do you think countries in Asia or the Middle East will ever engage in a conversation in the next decade or two about this subject or will same-sex marriage continue to be treated as a taboo subject? Amani, I'll start with you. I mean, can we, can we just get through talking about it within our own countries first before we start worrying about the Middle East and South Asia and the rest of the world? I mean, look at just the conversations that are taking place here in Australia. Um, likewise with some states in, in the United States as well. You know, here you have religious factions in the government that are creating these blanket policies impacting everyone, right? Um, and I think it's quite hypocritical because we tend to look at other countries, like in the Middle East, like Muslim countries, and we tend to condemn Sharia law. Oh, my God, how dare they conflate religion and politics? But that's exactly what we're doing In the here. United States, they say, oh, gosh, we can't conflate religion and politics. And yet, have you ever had a, a president who's not been... No, you have religious extremists in the White House. They're just Christian religious extremists. Exactly. So that's the, that's the right kind of extremist. Isn't this a great <laughs> subject to be optimistic about? I mean... My country, Holland, was the first country in 2001 to, to you know, have a, have a law that allows gay marriage. And now it's just, you know, spreading around the globe, right? If you look at the polls, for example, in the US, it's fascinating to see how quickly this is developing. We are, I mean, we've almost forgotten that someone like Hillary Clinton was against it just a few years ago. So it just shows you how utopia can become reality quite quickly. And when we have it, we're completely used to it. Shashi, like, uh, the question was really, really about fast. whether the... Um 
discussion will change uh, outside of the Western countries where it's become a kind of dominant uh, symbolic uh, argument. Well, the Western countries have an influence to some degree. But, for example, in India, I try to introduce a law that will simply decriminalize consensual sexual relations between consenting adults. And I was shouted down by the ruling party to a point that two attempts to just introduce a bill were not permitted. In other words, a bill never even got introduced, let alone discussed. That's the kind of resistance we're facing in India. Now, fortunately, the Supreme Court has just uh, given a ruling on the right to privacy that suggests we could very easily apply that in a court action to these issues, and that could, in turn, uh, widen the scope. Initially, once you make, you know, people's right to love each other legal, only then can you start thinking about things like marriage. We haven't got there yet. We have to take the first step first. Do, do you equate your government, incidentally, um, the Modi government... Is, with... And the opposition, not no, my no, government. No, 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 no. Uh, uh, yes, it is my government. Yes, it's my the government of stuff. India, yes. um, the Modi government. Do you sort of equate that with the religious right um, in other countries? In many ways, yes. I think Mr Modi, to his credit, hasn't himself, since becoming prime minister, said anything particularly directly bigoted, as he used to in his previous incarnation and during his campaigns. But he's unleashed forces that are really no different in many ways from the kind of right-wing religious talk we've seen in other countries from other religions. So it really is worrying that we're seeing a kind of naked chauvinism that wasn't polite to even express in the old days in India. Uh, Mani, now, you've got a website called Muslim... Uh, girl, and of course there are plenty of Muslim girls in Saudi Arabia, um, and plenty of Muslim girls in Iran. Um, and I'm just wondering whether you're kind of forced, in a sense, because you're based in the United States, to dodge the question of what should happen in the Middle East. I mean, we believe that nobody is voiceless, right? We don't speak. On, we don't believe in being a voice for the voiceless. Everyone has a voice, but there are those that are systematically silenced, just like in the Middle East. Um, and, and other parts of the world. We choose to not listen to them. Um, and for us, we can't really, you know, be hypocritical and then attempt to speak to the issues that Muslim women in other parts of the world are facing. We are a very Western publication. Um, but we do, we, we never shy away from the discussion around, uh, for example, same-sex marriage and, and many other uh, very progressive and, and, and uh, liberal type of issues. Um, and, and that's really where it starts. Is it's cultivating a space where we can have that open discussion. And you would be surprised to find how many Muslim women ar around the world, um, regardless of what walk of life they come from, are kind of bonded by those shared principles that are really founded within the religion itself. And how do conservative Muslim women in your own country respond uh, to these kind of arguments on your website? Conservative Muslims in, in the States? Mm. I mean, even just on my way over here to Australia, I got a message saying, you know, like, Amani's website is reaching a whole whole new height of blasphemy and things like that. But um, the whole point is really just to break open a space for those, for those conversations, right? For us, we, we seek out the narratives that are marginalized even within our own religious community and really bring them to the surface. Uh, and, and really, as long as we stick to those founding principles that make our religion what it is, whether it's gender equality, racial equality, financial equality, all of those things are the premise of Islam, regardless of what you want to believe or what you hear in the media, that's the truth. Um, that's what we stick to. And anything that kind of steers far beyond that line, that is, is none of our business. All right, we'll come back to some of those uh, issues later. Let's move on to our next question. It's from Kevin Peterson. Question. Sorry. My question is to Sashi Tharoor. Happy Olam first. Oh, thank you. Uh, um, you too. You, you, you mentioned about Britain... Uh, mentioned that Britain left India in, uh, in a worse-off condition than than it had it been without Britain. You also mentioned about reparation from Britain. What about the skills in engineering and manufacturing India acquired, the administrative and democratic processes it inherited, the infrastructure left behind, and most of all, the rapid education of the Indian people, of which you are an excellent e example? <laughs> Surely, no one can price these intangible values that were gained during the British rule in India and propel the country to its present position as one of the leading countries in the world. Finally, one more question. <laughs> I'm doing a Jeffrey Robertson here. In your opinion, where would India be today if the British did not step into India? 
Oh, there's a lot, lot there. It'll take the rest of the program to answer. I'll try and touch on it. <laughs> but this is almost like uh, the American saying to the widow of the American president, apart from that, Mrs. Lincoln, how did you enjoy the play? <laughs> I mean, you know, really, the British came to one of the richest countries in the world, uh, accounting for 27% of global GDP in 1700, 23% uh, in 1800, and over 200 years of exploitation, depredation, loot and destruction, reduced it to a poster child for third world poverty, uh, with just over 3% of global GDP, 90% of the population living below the poverty line when the British left in 1947, a literacy rate, you speak of education, a literacy rate below 17%, and a life expectancy of 27. The growth rate of British India from 1900 to 1947 was 0.001%. That's what they were doing while draining the country of taxes and resources. Education, my gosh, the British, the last thing they wanted to do was invest in educating Indians. Uh, it, Will Durant, the American historian traveling in India's late as 1930, pointed out that the entire expenditure of the British on education in India, from the nursery level to the highest universities, was less than half the high school budget of the state of New York. All the Indian institutes of technology, the engineering achievements you're talking about, were established after independence by the government of India. Uh, there is simply no comparison between the accomplishments of India rising from the ashes the British left us in and what was done in 200 years. Just, I've just given take, many, just take, many just, figures. Just take one example, the textile industry, because there you are. India was a, a huge exporter of For 2,000 years, it yes, was the world's on. leading exporter. What happened? In fact, in the Roman Empire, there are debates recorded by Pliny the Elder hmm. of Roman senators complaining about the amount of the Roman Empire's gold that was being sent off to India because of the tastes of Roman women for Indian muslins, linens, and, and cottons. But was so it, was, it just, was it just modernism, the Industrial Revolution yeah, that destroyed that, that, it, or was it something else? No, that's the excuse that apologists like mm -hmm. to make, that, you know, oh, it's not our fault, you just missed the bus for the Industrial Revolution. Well, we missed the bus because you threw us under its wheels, is what I tell <laughs> the Brits. <laughs> I mean, the fact is... The fact is, in the name of free trade, the British came in and destroyed the free trade that had made India a leading exporter of textiles. The British soldiers smashed the looms so people couldn't practice their craft. They imposed punitive duties and taxes on the export of Indian textiles while lifting duties on the import of British cloth. And they achieved a captive market at the point of a gun. This is not exactly free trade, as you can imagine. Cities like Murshidabad and Dhaka in the subcontinent were depopulated. In one notorious incident, weavers had their thumbs cut off, so when the looms were repaired, they couldn't weave again. Textiles were systematically destroyed as an industry by the British. And that's only one example of many... Well, in the I'm going to quickly go back to a question. Now, now Kevin, um, do you accept that perhaps the British weren't quite as benign as you just... <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Please read the book, Kevin. There's a lot more there. <laughs> I've got the book. I'll bring Laurie in here. He, he gave a speech along these lines to the Oxford Union. He got wild applause um, from the students and others sitting around the Oxford Union Hall. And I'm just wondering, have young Brits come to terms with their colonial past? Uh, no, we haven't at all. Young Brits of every class have no idea about our colonial past, and that is that is being deliberately done. We are deliberately denied or you know kept away from education about the real, the graphic facts of what the British did around the world, you know, including in this country to the people of this country. Uh, the crimes of the British and the crimes of the, that we committed and that were done in our names uh, over 400 years of religion and conquest is something that we don't like to think about, and yet it is everywhere in modern British history. When people talk about Brexit, it's stunning to me that if you ask British people who voted for Brexit what their major fear is, their fear is that people will come to our country and take our things. Mm. And That's exactly... Like, you know, <laughs> why... Yeah. I, I, I just can't... It, it doesn't compute, but we don't know this history. You know, I took history in British schools up to the age of 18, and I got a pretty good grade. And most You never of... learned a line of colonial history, did you? Well, almost everything that you have just said, I learned from your book.
I'm going, to, I'm going to throw quickly back to Shashi because um, you know, one of the great heroes of the Second World War, in fact, of the 20th century, uh, Winston Churchill, you've basically accused him in your book of complicity in a famine that killed four million Bengalis. Rightly so. 4.3. Yeah. I mean, Churchill personally took the decisions that actually not only plunged Bengal into starvation, but had the British actually purchase grain that the Bengalis could barely afford to buy in order to ship it to Europe not to aid the war effort, as his defenders claim, but to boost the buffer stocks in the event of a future possible invasion of Greece and Yugoslavia. People started dying, and Churchill said, well, it's all their fault anyway for breeding like rabbits. He said, I hate the Indians. They're a beastly people with a beastly religion. Oh Australian ships were docking in Calcutta port and were ordered by Churchill and his odious paymaster, General Lord Chobel, not to d disembark their wheat, but to sail on to Europe where their wheat might be used in some future reserve stock. On top of that, when conscience-stricken British know officials... Did, yes, I was going to say, did Churchill know people were dying? Yes, the conscience-stricken British officials are constantly sending memoranda to the Prime Minister personally, because it was his decision, saying that people were dying literally on the streets, and all Churchill could bring himself to do was write peevishly on the side of the file, why hasn't Gandhi died yet? Wow. And this is the man the British want us to hail as an apostle of freedom and democracy when he has as much blood on his hands as some of the worst genocidal dictators of the 20th century. Well, <laughs> thank you. You underlined that point so well we can let others debate it. You're watching the uh, Melbourne Writers' Festival Q&A. If you have a question for our political leaders, join Q&A in the House this Wednesday with the leader of the House, Defence Industry Minister Christopher Pine. Send your questions on defence, parliamentary procedure, citizenship and political shenanigans via Twitter, Facebook or our website by noon on Wednesday. And at 5.30pm Eastern Time, Christopher Pine will be there to answer when Q&A in the House streams live from Parliament on Facebook. Like our Facebook page for the notification. Now, our next question comes from Ema Sparks. In some Islamic nations, women are often deprived of basic human rights, such as driving a car, voting, or are even punished for exposing an ankle. In a world where women are often the guilty party to the crime of rape and must endure severe and inhumane punishment, aren't freedom and religion mutually exclusive? Amani. It's, it's really interesting because I think that it's uh, a byproduct of our own exceptionalism, the way that we choose to view other parts of the world and the issues that they're experiencing um, and, and kind of absolving ourselves of our own issues, right? When I think about the way that people misrepresent the oppression of, of women in Muslim, in Muslim regions, um, you know, it definitely heavily comes down to the way that they're represented uh, and the way that we choose to discuss them is as if those issues don't uh, don't exist within our own societies as well. For example, one of, uh, the biggest, uh, one of the biggest things that's always cited is honor killings. Honor killings are rampant. If you turn on the news, any type of program about Muslim women, you would assume that this is just a problem pervading the entire, the in, uh, entire region. Um, but then when you look at countries like Australia and like the United States, the top killer of women is domestic violence. But we choose to, to refer to it as domestic violence we choose to speak about it like it's a social issue um, and, and, of course, often really disregard it. But then when it happens in other countries, it's an honor killing. It's disgusting. It's backwards. It's inhumane, right? And, and really what I'm speaking to is that this is all symptomatic of patriarchy, mm -hmm. which is a global phenomenon. It just emerges in different cultures and different places in the world in different ways. So we really can't look to Muslim countries and say, you know, these issues are impacting them and, and whatnot, because by doing that, by extension, we immediately look at them in an inferior lens. And by doing that, that's how we in our countries disempower Muslim women around the world even further. Mm -hmm. We speak about them like we know what's best for them. You know, yeah, we just had Pauline um, in the parliament wearing a burqa and, and really just hijacking an entire conversation about what that means. And it's really funny to me about how even in countries where we pride ourselves on individual liberties, on knowing what liberation means, what freedom means, we still get hung up on the way women choose to dress. Why is the conversation, why does it stop there? I'm going to bring in Laurie here. What do you think about this? About which aspect of this? About whether... Uh, look, 
Well, I mean, the question was really about whether there's a serious discussion going on about uh, what happens to Muslim women in countries like Saudi Arabia and the obvious inequities for them. And we just heard an argument about the burqa. Um, I imagine a lot of women don't choose to wear the burqa but have to. Look, um, I agree with everything you've just said. And uh, look, my experience as a, as a feminist who is white is that I am often told the other side of this story, is that when I try to make an argument about domestic violence, an argument about the fact that one in five women in their lifetimes will be raped, um, I am immediately told, mostly by men, well, why are you talking about this nonsense when you should be talking about what's happening to Muslim women far away? So that we can only talk about sexism and misogyny and violence when it's being done in other countries far away. As it, it is... Um, no, but you, it, made, you made the argument earlier that you can talk about being two done things. In bad faith. You made the argument earlier that you can talk about two things at once. I mean, it's possible to have these discussions in our own country and also look at what's happening in other countries, isn't it? Well, the missing word here is agency, is choice. The, exactly like you said, um, there is a, the key issue with what a woman wears or what a, how a woman chooses to present is, is whether or not she's forced to do so. Mm -hmm. We seem to think... Obviously, if a woman is forced to wear anything, if anybody is forced to wear anything, like, ha have you been forced to wear a tie today? Because if somebody <laughs> no, my is... mother prefers it. Well, OK. <laughs> but, look, if somebody was forcing you to wear that tie and saying, look, you cannot have any kind of job if you don't come out in that tie day by day, then that would be oppressive. But if you've just chosen, or maybe just to please your mother, put on a tie, that's different, isn't mm -hmm. it? And yet, somehow, we're having... Somehow, there's always... There's always debate over what a woman chooses to wear and how she chooses to look, when actually that's the decoy for a broader debate. Sure. As if women aren't actually capable of having agency in the first exactly. place. Exactly. And, and I actually want to go back to your comment about the assumption that most women that wear burqas are forced to wear it. I mean, mm. that, that again goes back to... It's not the assumption that most women, but or, or that, or that, some of, women. Of course some women do, right? But to create a blanket policy about... Uh, you know, a specific garment on, on the, that assumption that it is forced, of mm. course, is another form of oppression. Mm. To, to go off mm. of what gonna, you're I'm saying... I'm going to interrupt you because we've got sure. a Twitter question that's just come in for you on this. The head covering was imposed by men on women. Why do you wear it? That's a Twitter question. I mean, who, who imposed me to wear this headscarf? It's my personal choice. I, I, I chose to put this on my head. But again, yeah. but again, you see, that's the way that we want to talk about Muslim women, right? As if they, they don't have an agency, as if they mm. can't make their own decisions and speak on their own behalf. And it's pretty convenient that we want to believe that yeah. Muslim women are being forced to dress a certain way and whatnot, because people don't want to believe that we want to assert our own values and do something that actually de defies what the West wants of us, right? If we want to talk about imposition and being forced to do something, I mean, what does that mean when... All of society's pressure and, and questions that I receive about why I'm wearing a headscarf, you know, that are kind of pushing me towards the fringes of, you know, no, you, you, should, you should remove that scarf. That's the way that you show well, you that make, you're I mean, you make, you, the, the but, point, but, No, I'm, I'm just going to say, you, sure. you make a good point, because in France, uh, as yes. soon as they tried to ban the headscarf, yes. all women wanted to wear it. Mm -hmm. Sure. I mean, so what I'm saying is, what, what is Western society demanding of me then when they're trying to pressure me to remove my headscarf if not to impose on me what I should, how I should dress. Mm. When we, when, I, I just have one more again, point sure. uh, about France, right? And, and this is in the context of the burqa, right? If we want to say that it's wrong to, um, to impose any type of garment on a woman or, or dictate how she choose to, chooses to dress in public, when the, burqa, the burkini ban happened last summer on French beaches, pictures emerged from the south of France showing French police Please. forcing Muslim women to undress to take clothes off. That's not liberation. How is that any different than the moral police in Muslim countries that we want to judge for forcing a woman to put on a headscarf? It's literally flip sides to the same coin. Good. Um, Michael, you want to jump in? Well, there's one other missing word, I think, and that's universal. And I, I think uh, human rights are universal. And the... I don't disagree with what a lot of the panellists have said today, but I do disagree with one point, and that is that because we have frailties as a society, therefore we shouldn't be calling out human rights abuses abroad. The idea that because there's domestic violence in Australia, we shouldn't be calling out honour kill killings abroad. The idea that our society is so hopeless and frail that therefore it's, 
it's uh, cultural imperialism to tell other people how to live their lives. I don't believe in that. I think that that there are a certain number of uh, universal human rights. I'm not talking about telling women how what they what can what they can wear and what they shouldn't wear. And we should be absolutely consistent. We should be clear-eyed on ourselves, but also on others. We should apply not a different lens to other societies, but no less of a lens to other societies than we apply to ourselves. I mean, okay, no, I've, I've got to interrupt because uh, yeah. we, we're running out of time. We've got a few questions we have to get to. This one's from Edward Cliff. My question's on a bit of a different topic. Um, there are many studies that show that being in work uh, is good for people, that it helps their health, their mental health, their physical health, uh, their social situation, gives them social supports and, and I guess, a, a sense of purpose. Even if we can afford something like a universal basic income, um, is it really the best thing for people in terms of their health and in terms of their sense of uh, self-worth? Mm -hmm. Rutger, I'm going to go to you because you are, I guess, one of the leading proponents of this mm -hmm. idea in the world. Uh, I hope so. Um, to be honest, um, I think it's quite logical that people are happy to be in, in, to at least have a job these days because the welfare state is, has become so incredibly humiliating. I mean, you're basically being told that you have to prove all over again that you're sick enough, that you're depressed enough, that you're really a hopeless case, and then maybe the government will give you a little bit of money. So I think it's quite logical that people are happy if they're not in that system. Now, what I think that what would happen with a basic income is that a lot of people... Just tell us exactly what a universal basic yeah, income a is, because sure most people yeah. won't really know. Well, it's a very simple idea, actually. A basic income is a, is a monthly grant that is enough to pay for your basic needs. So food, shelter, clothing. It's completely unconditional, so everyone gets it, whether you're rich or poor, employed, unemployed, doesn't matter. Um, and, uh, you know, no one's going to tell you what you have to do for it, what you have to do with it. It gives you the freedom to decide for yourselves what you want to make of your life. Um, I'll just make one point here. Richard Nixon, um, most surprisingly, mm -hmm. tried to legislate for a universal basic income, but it's gone off the agenda completely since then. Why is it coming back now? Well, there are a few reasons, I guess. I mean... And why did he want to do it? The most obvious reason for many people is that the robots are coming for a job, so there are some projections that say that 50% of all jobs are, you know, going to be gone in 20 years' time. There'll be uh, new jobs in robot repair, though. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's true. <laughs> and I think, I think that it's important to, to remember that, you know, now, according to recent polls, about a third of the workforce is stuck in what they consider a meaningless job, mm -hmm. and we should not underestimate capitalism's extraordinary ability to come up with more completely useless, meaningless jobs. So that will probably go on for quite a while. And it, it, I think it also means that we have to completely rethink, actually, and this also goes back to your question, what is work? Like, yep. when do we actually contribute to society? I mean, when we talk about nurses, teachers, care workers, these are, like, the, the most important jobs. If they, they go on strike, it's a disaster. We can't do without them. Now, we are wasting right now in this country and elsewhere an extraordinary amount of talent, ambition and intelligence of young people going to jobs, you know, in the advertising industry and banking. And, and if these people will go on strike, it's, it's not much of a problem, actually. I've got one story in the book about a, about a strike of garbage or, or of bankers in 1970. It's Did the only strike there? in all of world history that I could find of bankers. And nothing much happened, actually. <laughs> <laughs> it, it lasted for six months and, 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 you know, the bankers came back and said, all right, all right, all right. We'll get I, back I, to I, work, I, so. I understand what you're saying, but if all banks stopped distributing money to people, it would be a serious problem. Well, no, in Ireland, what the Irish did is they developed their own money system, you know, from the bottom up. So they started writing IOUs on checks or on, on, on toilet paper yeah. and... and and on the backs of cigars. And the, the pubs became the new banks, actually. So there's one economist, this is a really funny story. There's one economist who later wrote that, you know, if you sell liquids, then you know something about the liquidity of your clients. So the pub owners were like the, the perfect new <laughs> bankers. And that's, you know, I think it sort of shows that, sure, we need a financial sector, but we can do without a lot of the speculation and nonsense that's All in right. there. Well, right. You'd have to charge a lot of taxes to pay for this basic income, wouldn't you? I think that a basic income is actually an investment that pays for itself. Mm -hmm. I mean, what we really cannot afford is something like poverty. I mean, if you look at, uh, at a country like the US, just child poverty alone, it's yep. $500 billion per year in terms of health care costs, you know, mm -hmm. higher crime rates, kid, kids performing less well in school, and it would be about $175 billion to completely eradicate poverty. I mean, we've got the means, we've got the evidence. They did, test, they, do. They did do a test with a bunch of homeless men uh, mm -hmm. where they gave them the, the uh, basic income and they ended up saving money in terms of their welfare outcomes. Yeah, and even The Economist. 
I mean, The Economist is not a very left-wing, le radical <laughs> magazine, right? Even they wrote that the best way to spend money on the homeless might be just to give it to them. So they, they really found out that the homeless were very frugal with the money, they made very important, good decisions with it, and seven out of 13 of the men had a roof above their head. So it makes financial sense. And I think this is also, it goes back to you know, the, the, where we started our discussion. Mm -hmm. I think it's important that the left starts rethinking their strategy and maybe we should sometimes try different language. You know? For example, just show that, that it, this, these kind of proposals are actually, actually investments. And you sort of used right-wing business-like language to defend, to defend progressive ideas. OK, money for nothing, an idea whose time may have come. We've got time for one last question. It's from Jacob Haywood. Hi there, panel. Uh, this is a question to all of you. I uh, wanted to ask that the extremes of the Trump presidency and the North Korean regime have spurred a sharp uptake in the purchase of dystopian novels and not to mention the comparisons to fictional dictatorships over the last 12 months. Does this trend confirm our growing cynicism towards global politics, or does it indicate an inspired mass awakening of would-be readers? Is this the best time for a writer to pen their own doomsday novel? <laughs> Shashi, start with you. I think we should actually pen a utopian novel, get some ideas from Rutgers. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, the truth is that, obviously, uh, you mentioned at the beginning that 1984 has become a bestseller again. And in some ways, uh, it seems very apposite because we're living in a time in which thought control, information control, and so on seems so much more possible because of advances in technology. But at the same time, the world is a much freer place. There are multiple outlets. In my, in my own country, there is a feeling that the saving grace of a government that's become perhaps all too powerful is the fact that we have now so many different alternatives in the media, including social media, to express things that perhaps the rich and therefore subornable owners of mainstream media won't allow to be said in mainstream media. So in, in many, many ways, it seems to me that our times have got both better and worse at the same time. And therefore, I think if we had to write a novel fantasizing, it should be about a mm -hmm. utopia. There's well, actually a beautiful... I, 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 yes, you can quickly... You're not going to write a novel. There's actually novel. a beautiful quote from Mahatma Gandhi. Well, he never actually really said it, but it's still a beautiful quote. Um, <laughs> <laughs> first, they ignore you, then they laugh at you, then they fight you, and then you win. I mean, that, is, that should always be our, our mantra. And, and Oscar Wilde said that a map of the world that doesn't show utopia on it is not worth having. <laughs> one problem, though, the one problem, though, this quote from Mahatma Gandhi popped up on the Instagram page of Donald Trump in 2015. Right. So mm. he understands it often better than we do. It's so let's, let's go back to that spirit of utopian thinking. Michael? I was going to say one thing. Donald Trump may not be good for the world, but he's great for think tanks. <laughs> uh, he's great for think tanks and he's great for writers. And if there's, if there's one little optimistic um, note we can take is that I think he spurs us, he, he, he makes us, you know, gird our loins and come up with the arguments against him. And I also think there's going to be a demonstration effect from some of these events, Donald Trump's election, uh, Brexit and so on. The world will see the Trump presidency is not going to be a success. Brexit is not going to be a success and the silent majority, I think, will realise that. So I don't think we should, we should give up all hope yet. Um, the Last Muslim Girl. I mean, what, what sort of dystopian novel would you write? I mean, I think that it's a really great sign that more people are reading dystopian novels because it shows kind of a heightened awareness, a heightened self-awareness of kind of what we've gotten ourselves into. But I will also say that uh, I, coming from Trump's America, coming here from there, and uh, I, I will say that for many of us, that we're living in that dystopia right now. Mm -hmm. So maybe it's time for us to put the books down and start facing that reality. Laurie, um, Handmaiden's Tale uh, seems to have done quite well, been turned into a popular TV series in the time of Trump. Well, we have to think about what fiction actually does. And one of the things that fiction does is it's a form of trauma rehearsal. One of the reasons that we are gravitating so hard, particularly young people, to dystopian books right now and have been for many years is there's a sense that if we can follow characters through these dreadful stories, then maybe we can learn how we might ourselves survive, even if they're not happy stories. But that's why I think dystopia isn't where it 
can end. What we have now is a broad failure of political imagination going right down the generations. And the work we need to do as activists, as writers, as thinkers, is, a, is imaginative work first, first and foremost. It's not just about policy change. It's like Rutger says about creating the conditions to make the previously impossible inevitable, reimagining work, reimagining gender, reimagining what religious freedom and freedom of speech means. These are all imaginative exercises. And, that's, and maybe that's not utopian, but it certainly is much more than is demanded of us by the, you know, neoliberalism wants us to have a dystopian view of the future. If if you, can, if you can only imagine the future in terms of what you've lost, then that's when people turn to right-wing politics. And we need more. We need a bigger imagination politically. We have to write the end on that one. Thank you, Laurie. And thanks to all our panels. That's all we have time for tonight. Please thank the panel. Rukka Bergman, Rani al Kitabi, Shashi Theroux, Laurie Penny and Michael Fulilo. Thank you. Thank you. No, that's fine. That's fine. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, remember, you can continue the discussion on Q&A Extra with Tracy Holmes and dissident writer Nama Carlin. They're taking comments on ABC News Radio and Facebook Live just as soon as we finish. And this Wednesday, join Q&A in the House on Facebook Live at 5.30pm Eastern Time when the government's leader of the House, Christopher Pyne, will answer your questions. Go to our website or follow our Facebook page to find out how to ask a question. Now, next Monday, I'll be at the Q&A desk again with Israeli parliamentarian and feminist Marav McKayley, who argues not just against same-sex marriage, but against all marriage. Liberal frontbencher Zed Cecilia, Shadow Attorney General Mark Dreyfus, Independent Senator for South Australia, Lucy Gu Shuhei, and philosopher and author A.C. Grayling. Until then, good night.